Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're just going to hold off for another minute or two as people continue to join. All right, well, we have a few more people trickling in, but let's kick it off because we have a very exciting discussion today. The first hello, my name is Kristen Hanser, and I'm the Senior Partnership Manager at the Green Sports Alliance. And first, just on behalf of the Alliance team, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. I hope you all are safe and healthy, and we're really looking forward to this discussion. Fantastic lineup of speakers, as you can see here, from Vera, South Pole, and the Philadelphia Eagles on the discussion of carbon reduction and offsetting strategies within the sports industry. I also just want to thank LNS Captioning, which is providing captioning for today's session. And if you need to use those services, you can see that in the chat box on the GoToWebinar dashboard. You should see our my video at the moment and the slides on your screen. And then as our speakers come on, they'll share their videos. And after they each present, you will see all of our videos. There should be a line in between the visual and the slides for you to toggle up and down if you'd like to manage it on your own. So first, just want to give a couple of housekeeping items that today's webinar recording and the slides will be emailed out to the attendees following the session and that you can also find the recording on our YouTube page here. We have previous webinar recordings on our YouTube page as well, so feel free to go check those out and take a watch on some other topics that might interest you. And if you have any questions about today's session, then feel free to just contact us here at our info at email. In case you have not seen, just another reminder that our 2020 summit, which was originally planned for June, has been postponed to a date to be determined. More information will be available soon on our website, and of course, you can always contact myself or other members of our team if you have any questions. And before we kick off, I just want to let everyone know, if you haven't joined us on a webinar before, that the, the process for today, each speaker will give a few minutes of a background and presentation on their role and their organization, and then we'll spend at least the second half of the hour going through some Q&A. So thank you to everyone who submitted questions prior to joining on the registration form. And if you have questions throughout the session, just go to the chat box and enter them in, and we'll try to get through as many as we can. All right, so now it's my pleasure to introduce our first guest, David Antonioli, CEO of Vera. David works to ensure that the standards Vera identifies, develops, and manages facilitate the flow of capital to enable countries, the private sector, and civil society achieve their climate and sustainable development goals. So David, thank you for kicking us off today. Great, well thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure to follow up on the summit from last year. It's a shame we can't all be together, um, but last year was a great introduction to the work of the Green Sports Alliance and the great work that the teams are doing. I know that uh, everybody is staying safe and healthy out there. It's hard to think about, you know, a world without sports, but we're certainly feeling the impact of that now. Hopefully we can all be back soon enough. But um, I guess what I wanted to do today is really kind of walk you through a little bit about how a, a, a climate plan can include offsetting and how that can be to the benefit of teams or leagues um, and sports-related organizations. Um, as Vera, we've been involved in helping to offset 
a number of events. Um, the 2012 and the 2016 Olympics were offset in part with credits that we issue. Um, the 2014 FIFA World Cup was as well. And, and both NASCAR and MLS have, have used uh, some of the credits that we issue. Um, so what I think is important and relevant to, to the audience here is that, you know, offsetting offers teams a really great opportunity, particularly in respect of engaging with fans. Um, offsetting and, and offsetting projects can have a number of um, angles, if you will, that enable teams to really access some of the work that they're doing on the ground to link to the team's activities. So for example, projects tend to have and can have a lot of really important sustainable development outcomes. So whether that's helping you know, provide education to little kids, um, health clinics, uh, helping uh, empower women, uh, there's a lot of really unique elements of projects, which I'll get into, that can, that can be useful for fan engagement. You know, a lot of projects end up helping with biodiversity. So there's great links to, to particular animals. You know, obviously the, the teams are filled with uh, great mascots, whether it's the bears, the eagles, the panthers, you name it. Um, there's links to those uh, types of protection efforts that link to carbon reduction activities, particularly when you're looking at forest conservation or forest restoration activities. There's links related to geography. Carbon projects happen all over the world, so they can resonate with a particular group, uh, whether it's you know projects in Africa, Latin America, Asia, you name it. And of course, there's, there's different elements and liking uh, of different project types that can be readily available for teams to use as part of their offsetting strategy. Um, next slide, please. Um, but I think it's really important to consider that when you look at carbon offsetting and carbon reductions in context, they really need to be part of a broader mitigation effort. Um, so if you go to the next one, generally offsets are a small part of the kinds of reductions that teams really, you know, we believe ought to be taking. So this involves, you know, taking into account um, activities that are, that are within your control. And that could include energy efficient lighting in, in stadiums, or renew, using renewable energy to power your facilities, uh, providing electric vehicle charging stations, uh, providing healthy uh, and sustainable food options to customers who come, or fans who come to the games. There's all the kinds of things that need to be done that are done internally are really important that then enable, uh, you know, in, in this case, teams or leagues to go beyond and create a comprehensive climate strategy that would involve offsets. So really the way we think about it is, you wanna have a, a hierarchy of reductions. If you can go to the next one, please. Um, you know, you wanna measure your footprint, you wanna reduce inside what you can, and then you wanna offset on the outside what, you, what you're able to. And that really tends to be related to the residual footprint that you cannot address by whatever you're doing internally. So this is really important. Not only, it's really important from a governance perspective. You don't want to just use offsets because they can be, that can be seen as, as, a, as a easy way out. But if used properly, they can be really powerful. And I, I use the analogy of brushing your teeth and flossing your teeth. You know, you can floss all you want, but if you're not brushing your teeth, then your teeth are probably gonna rot and fall out anyway. So they need to be done in concert. So, and offsets really need to come as part of the, at the end part of the process when you're thinking, okay, do we really wanna go beyond what we're doing? But if you do, then there's great opportunities. Um, if you go to the next one, please, this is a slide from the ecosystem marketplace. It just illustrates the growth in the voluntary carbon market, which is where we are operating and what we're describing here. It's really for companies, teams, leagues to go beyond their in internal reductions to say, we want to be carbon neutral and we want to invest in projects that are reducing greenhouse gas emissions in a credible fashion. And this graph shows how the you know, number of issued, issued credits has grown in the market, as well as how retirements have grown. And retirements are really the end use of the unit. So if you, once we issue a credit, it's in the market. And then at some point, a team, for example, might say, well, I'm gonna buy those credits and retire them from use. And that's what the lighter blue, um, graph shows but i think the key point here is that over time this market has been growing and continues to grow significantly um, next one please um, the the carbon accounting and crediting standards such as our vcs program are becoming really important in making sure that this market has credibility and has given it the confidence for it to grow and so that growth trajectory that you saw before really i think is in many ways 
a reflection of the fact that there's now a set of standards that make sure that when you are buying and retiring a carbon credit, it is real, it represents you know, real emission reduction, it's been audited by a third party. Um, all those things that you need to have confidence that this is real and that your investment is actually having a really tangible impact. Um, you can see from the graph below that the, you know the, the the part of the graph below that we are the leader in this in the space. Um, you know a, a vast majority of the credits are issued, whether it's by our VCS program or com a combination of our, our our VCS program and our CCB program, which stands for the Climate Community and Biodiversity Standards. So in the early parts, I was talking about how many of these projects help to conserve biodiversity, especially when you're thinking about forest conservation or forest restoration projects. So in this case, if you're thinking about, you know, forest that's protecting pumas, right? Well, that's a really nice link to the activities that might be related to a team that might be the, you know, the pumas uh, or any, any type of that biodiversity. So those, those are really important. Um, and, but another really important feature of the market what we're seeing is that there's a growing interest in projects that look at what are called natural climate solutions. So if you go to the next slide, please. Um, uh, you know, what you see here is a graph showing the credits that we as an organization have been issuing over the last several years. And what you see interestingly here in 2016 is that we saw a flip that credits from natural climate solutions, which, you know, really embark anything related to forest, um, agriculture, or land use types of activities, those have now become a critical part or an increasingly uh, important part of our portfolio. And I think that will probably tend to be that case in the future. Um, and if you go to the next one, please, what happened is that in the early days of the market, the credits that were available tended to be in the renewable energy space, landfill gas, um, HFC and N2O or industrial types of applications is where industrial gases were being destroyed. But these, in many ways, are, have either been regulated out of, out of the market. One of the key criterion that we ask any project is, is it required by regulation? And if the regulation requires this particular gas to be controlled, then it cannot issue a carbon credit because it doesn't represent an investment that would go above and beyond what normally would have happened. So these kinds of projects are either being regulated or are now coming into their own and can stand on their own. So for example, renewable energy projects, we think in general, can now stand on their own and don't need carbon finance. So that really has opened up the market to being uh, to embracing natural climate solutions. If you go to the next one, please, and you'll see that um, you know, the first iteration of natural climate solutions were red projects. And this stands for reduced emissions from avoided deforestation and forest degradation. And there's a lot of projects that are that are now basically protecting force um, and, and and generating emission reductions or avoid uh, avoiding emission reductions from the fact that those forests are not being deforested. If you go to the next one, what we're seeing is the next generation of this. We're looking at, at uh, afforestation, reforestation, and revegetation projects. A lot of blue carbon projects. So these tend to be in in uh, in mangroves, in you know, in sea grasses, and then a, a new and upcoming activity tends to be agricultural land management, so capturing carbon in soils. So, so these are kind of the, where, where we see the market going and being really critical elements of where, where natural climate solutions are going, but also the kinds of offsets that I would imagine uh, teams and leagues might be most interested in. Um, and I think one of the really important things about all of these, I mentioned this before, that many of these projects because they're working with communities, um, local communities, in many cases in other parts of the world, they're really delivering very powerful and tangible uh, sustainable development benefits. If you go to the next slide, please, um, you'll see that here's just a good example, a smattering of the kinds of things that these projects are providing. And these can be really powerful, right? They, they, they provide job opportunities for people, clean water, schools, you name it. And these, can, these also can be really important for fan engagement if, if uh, fans really care about a particular kind of project, or even if a team or a league were to select a, a project and then report on the you know, continuing updates from these projects. That can be a really powerful sense of belonging and, and, and engagement with you know, a community that may be benefiting from the investment of, uh, by a team or a league. 
Um, and if you go to the next one, I mean, just a couple, one quick example, I mentioned this before, NASCAR purchased and retired VCUs. VCUs are verified carbon units, which are the credits that we issue from a forest protection project in Zimbabwe. Um, underneath, you see the, the icons of the sustainable development impacts, what this project is achieving. Um, and the next one, uh, please, a Major League Soccer, soccer purchased credits from a, a clean cook stoves project in Kenya. So these are just two small examples of the kinds of projects that, um, that teams and leagues are using to make that climate commitment. And so to bring it all to a close, I'd say that you know, uh, carbon offsets are a great way to have a comprehensive climate action plan. Of course, you need to do your homework first and make sure that it's part of a broader package that reflects internal reductions that are done in the stadium and in, in the facilities, et cetera. But if the teams are willing and able to engage and take that extra step to, um, to offset their residual emissions, then there's fantastic opportunities in respect of how these can link to the teams, whether it's uh, links to non-carbon benefits, to the geography of projects, to the project types, or to the biodiversity, which might relate to the protection of, of a particular animal or species. Um, so with that, I'll stop and I'm glad to take questions at the end. Thank you very much. Joel, thank you, David, for that good introduction to mitigation and the role offsetting plays and also some of those uh, fantastic examples in the sports world. So our next speaker, pass it on to Nick Astor, who is the Director of Marketing in North America at South Pole. So Nick has over 20 years of experience in journalism, media design, and digital media, both in the U.S. and abroad. He's also a recognized public speaker and thought leader covering sustainability, corporate social responsibility, environmental issues, and technology. So Nick, over to you. Thanks very much, Kristen. Good to be here. Um, thanks very much, David. Uh, I thought that the, the best thing I could do here would really just give you guys a real crash course introduction to what South Pole is all about, um, but ultimately open the door to a deeper conversation about credits and sustainability action in general and as it pertains to sports. Um, David already did a terrific introduction to what we, just to cut to the chase, think is probably the number one reason to do it, and that has to do with fan, enga fan engagement and aligning one's sustainability strategy with the overall mission of, of different sports organizations. Carbon credits are great, they're all part of the solution, but um, the, the, the really exciting thing that these uh, projects bring to you is an opportunity to engage with fans, uh, excite people, um, and of course, solidify and build the, um, the, the, the social and environmental mission that your organizations um, uh, may have. Um, why don't we just go to the next slide? Uh, just a little bit about who we are. Uh, we've been around since 2004. Uh, we are best known as a climate project developer. Um, we have huge variety of different projects, uh, both the uh, nature-based or, or, or nature natural climate solutions, we call nature-based solutions, same thing, uh, type of projects which are all over the world, everything from the type of, of, uh, of uh, forest reforestation, um, uh, ecosystem preservation, um, projects to many that have very specific social components as well. Um, as well as some of the uh, renewable energy and uh, methane capture and some of the what we call less charismatic projects, which are also out there as well. Um, based in Zurich, um, with a growing presence here in the United States, uh, folks uh, in here in Philadelphia, New York, uh, and in California, and hopefully elsewhere soon. Um, next slide. Uh, just a little bit about the scope that we've re reached, um, uh, have had a huge land impact, um, lots and lots of uh, carbon sequestered and uh, credits retired over the years. Um, next slide. Uh, we've worked with a huge variety of companies, government agencies, nonprofits, and so on, uh, both inside and outside of the sports uh, arena. Um, adjacent to sports, a lot of suppliers as well, Adidas, Fila, companies like that. Next slide. Uh, and a little look at kind of what we do. Um, I also should have mentioned we are more than just a carbon offsets provider. We also have a full uh, a suite of consultancy uh, practices um, as well as uh, uh, climate fund development um, and um, uh, and um, renewable energy uh, credits and recs and so on, and a consultancy built, built around that as well. But 
for the purposes of, of mostly what we're going to talk about today, we're, we're talking about climate and credits and, and offsets and so on. Um, a, when one seeks to go out and quantify uh, one's impact on climate, um, these are some of the main things that you're going to go out and look at. Um, in sport, uh, the number one uh, issue is tends to be uh, flying, flying teams around, and of course, uh, fans and fan travel to um, to uh, to events and so on, as well as the stadium operations as well, which is fairly obvious. Um, w just to bring it up, since we've been talking about it, um, one of our clients, the New York Mets, uh, I, driving uh, is the first thing on this slide, and 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 a lot of folks hadn't considered uh, measuring the impact of fan travel to games as part of their footprint. Um, that's something that we did with the Mets. They should uh, give them a, a bit of a, of a of a kudos for doing that, um, and in doing so, uh, allows them to uh, put incentives in place to give fans opportunities to carpool opportunities to, to take transit in other ways that can help reduce that footprint as well as engage fans and make them uh, feel good about their transportation choices and we can get into some of the, some of the details of, of that in the q a it was a particularly cool uh move by the mets um other than that flying tends to be the largest uh footprint for teams um, despite that, you know, a sports team still has a relatively small carbon footprint when you compare it to some of the other clients that we have, the big corporations, manufacturers, cruise lines, airlines, uh, folks like that. Um, so it represents a relatively small um, financial investment in something that can reap big rewards in terms of, uh, 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 as we mentioned, the, the, the fan engagement and the um, various different stakeholder engagement, including even players who, who are caring about this kind of stuff now. Um, next slide. Um, we don't need to spend too much time on this. Uh, Norman covered this pretty well. Um, just a, a lot of details about different uh, types of uh, projects. Um, the nature-based ones are the ones that we spend most of our time on now because they, they have the most interesting story and um, what we like to call charisma associated with them, but we also do a lot of work with clean energy and uh, um, and uh, some of the other projects as well. So we can move on from here. Uh, we work with a, a lot of different uh, sporting organizations. I mentioned the Mets would be remiss not to mention their friends across the city. Um, uh, the Yankees, uh, we had did a big project with them. Uh, uh, full footprint analysis and then uh, offsetting, uh, which in their case, they chose to work with the Clean Cook Stove project that we uh, spearheaded in Zimbabwe and Uganda. Uh, MBA, we've been working with closely. Um, at this point, we have uh, worked with them on some of their major uh, league-wide events, drafts, the finals, the all-star game, um, et cetera. Um, and MLS, uh, we've had a terrific uh, relationship with them, uh, bringing out one of our um, sort of more consultancy sides of what we do, working with them on, on how they have uh, gone out to engage with their fans. Um, got thrown a little bit of a loop because of COVID. Um, so we had to think a little bit more uh, carefully about how we um, communicated climate as a priority. Um, again, we can get into that a little bit in the Q&A. Um, at the end of the day, uh, teams and many of the companies we are working with are, are still very much uh, uh, taking the issue of climate seriously despite the current circumstances. Um, it may have taken a little bit of a backseat in terms of what's most visible and what's most urgent in terms of, of what needs to be attended with uh, from a communications perspective. Um, but from a long-term strate strategy perspective, uh, climate action and sustainability in general uh, tend to be um, important things to pay attention to uh, in terms of building the long-term resiliency of any organization. And so we've been uh, happy to see that that remains a priority um, among most of the folks that we've worked with and, and most of the folks that have continued to talk to us and, and sports is no exception. Um, next slide. Uh, this is what we call our climate journey. It's kind of a framework that we like to uh, use to uh, invite people into this conversation. Um, this is not really meant to be a, a, a sort of a hierarchy or a, or a logical order. Um, different organizations fit uh, on different um, places on this journey. Um, the things that are probably most relevant uh, right now 
um, in terms of this audience, we've had is the the the, the measurement, um, the ultimate uh, path to finding a reduction, and then in my opinion, when it comes to sports, the most important thing is is how we communicate and show leadership. Um, you know, I mentioned that yes, of course, sports has a footprint. It happens to be relatively small, still matters, still needs to be accounted for. Um, but the big opportunity here is communication. I've, I'm fond of. Uh, of, uh, of, of saying that there's, there's nothing short of religion that can engage as many people in one place at one time about any topic than sports. And uh, that can, that, as many of you probably know, it may not be fans' number one priority to come in and, and hear a lecture on climate change. In fact, it, 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 they shouldn't get a lecture on climate change. But the fact that um, but fans do very much care about whether their team and whether their league is uh, doing good in their community. Um, and that can be everything from traditional philanthropic efforts, players going out, working on playgrounds with kids, uh, to a whole suite of environmental uh, matters. Uh, climate change is sometimes a little bit abstract, um, which is one of the reasons why we um, uh, offer so many projects that have a, a specific charismatic value. Um, and increasingly local value as well. Um, projects are less common in the United States uh, simply because they cost more, um, but that is something that is, is starting to change and is something that we're starting to develop as well. But despite that, uh, the fact that um, organizations can help mitigate their, their uh, carbon impact and still tell a terrific story about how, uh, their, um, the, how they have done so and also reach these people around the globe, improving lives, improving sustainable economies, um, building more resilience in general into the economy. There's a hundred ways to tell this story um, simplistically as well as with great detail, um, which uh, all, all of which raises the, um, the, the general sentiment of a, of a sports organization among fans and other stakeholders. So it's a, it's a fun story to tell. Um, it's something that uh, uh, matters a lot and, uh, and, and we think is the, is the way to go with climate. Um, may have one more slide, I think. Do I think we? That's the last one All that right, we have. Um, well, like I said, I wanted to keep this one relatively brief. You know, David did a terrific introduction to, um, to kind of some of the nuts and bolts. And, um, you know, but what, what most excites us here at South Pole is, you know, not just being able to provide the uh, the opportunity to help organizations uh, take care of their footprint, so to speak, but to help communicate why that's been done uh, and to uh, offer them ways to engage with their fans and stakeholders um, in a really meaningful way um, that will get them excited without hitting them over the head with too many details, recognizing that, you know, um, this is sort of a at least when you're at the game, this is not necessarily top of mind. So finding a strategic way to, to, um, to get this information out there um, and use it to uh, grow the whole um, ecosystem of sports. Great. Well, thank you very much, Nick, for the background on South Pole. And we're seeing several questions come in on that whole fan experience and fan engagement side. So we will definitely be getting to that. So let me first introduce our last speaker. So we have Norman Vosholta, aptly Director of Fan Experience as we get into that conversation for the 2018 Super Bowl champion Philadelphia Eagles. Norman, originally from Berlin, Germany, has over 16 years of experience practicing consumer and client relations, spending eight of those years at the Walt Disney Company, serving as the ambassador for Disney under corporate citizenship, and now serves as, of many things, one of the, the Go Green spokespersons for the Eagles. So Norman, over to you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, the, the introduction there. Um, so welcome everyone uh, and, and Go Eagles. I know I'm sure that there's plenty of non-Eagles fans out there as well, but I know we're all fans of uh, sustainability. So I guess there's, there's one thing that uh, unites us here. Um, and thank you so much for uh, David and Nick, uh, great presentations there. Um, so, you know, as a football team in 2003, when we built Lincoln Financial Field, we um, asked ourselves um, and we looked at our, our, quite frankly, at our power bill and we were like, wow, blown away by how much money we spent there. 
And uh, we told ourselves, you know, just like you and I are a citizen, we are a corporate citizen. And um, that's a, a, one of those cool terms I, I stole from the uh, Walt Disney Company. They like to call themselves a corporate citizen. Uh, we have a responsibility, right? And so our ownership and our executive leadership decided, hey, let's just look at what we can do. Uh, one of the lowest hanging fruits was putting a blue bin on everyone's desk, and that has now uh, grown into a um, huge, um, you know, awesome uh, sustainability program, which includes um, uh, solar panels that we produce 40% of our own energy, and uh, uh, you know, we're 100% um, uh, clean energy driven uh, facility and stadium and team, and uh, we are over 99% landfill free. And um, yeah, thank you so much for that slide there. Uh, one thing that that when folks come up to me, you know, is from other teams or other sports venues and say, like, well, you know, how did you get there? The one thing, in all honesty, and that's where I think uh, it's so great that we have Nick and, and David on here, but it's partners, partners, partners. Um, sports teams are very small entities. Uh, you know, we have uh, multi-billion dollar organizations, but we are very small. We're run by 230, 220. Some teams have 150 people, and that's it. You wear all these different hats. My day job, I run our staffing operation in the stadium. Uh, and our fan experience and oversee anything the season ticket members or fans touch. But um, I also oversee our sustainability program and I'm the spokesperson for that because I worked under the corporate citizenship umbrella at Disney. And so there was a, a nice, you know, crossover bridge there for me to to uh, step into this. And uh, but one one thing that um, is so important to it, really any sports team because you just can't get anything done without it uh, is, is partners. We wouldn't have our large uh, solar uh, installation if it wasn't for NRG. We wouldn't uh, have learned all the ways that we can recycle plastics if it wasn't for our partner Brascom, uh, and so on, right? And so, um, we, with as far as um, what we're talking about today, uh, with some of the carbon offsetting, we have a couple strategies. Um, one is our Go Zero program. Um, we basically decided this was actually quite a few years ago. Um, uh, in 2008 um, to offset 100% of uh, team travel. Um, I know that uh, Nick just alluded to that, but um, we, uh, you know, use planes. We decided, you know, when we go to New York, we don't need to fly. We can take buses. When we go down to uh, Washington, D.C., once a year, we can use the train. Um, but then whenever we fly, we partnered with, um, uh, we actually, um, um, partnered with the Conservation Fund and uh, the uh, Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources in 2008, and we created a 6.5 acre Eagles Forest in Ben Salem, PA. And so far, we've donated over $80,000 to that, and they've planted about 10,000 trees, which trap about 9,000 metric tons of carbon over their lifetime. So that's one of our strategies. Uh, next slide. And then uh, strategy two, if you look to the right here, um, you know, this is very interesting again to our partners when they see something like this that they can jump onto and they can say, hey, we might be able to help out there. Um, we uh, established what we call a field goal forest program with one of our partners, um, uh, PGW, to further or reduce our carbon uh, footprint. Um, that's the Philadelphia Gas Works uh, basically decided that, um, um, you know, for uh, we, we're going to plant 10 trees in our Eagles Forest for every successful field goal made and we have we have uh, an awesome kicker uh, in Elliott and so um, we've planted 930 trees to the Eagles Forest, 360 and 17, 280 and 18 and 290 and 19. Uh, in case you love numbers, there you go. Um, and uh, that uh, carbon strategy reduction aligns with our business strategies because um, our folks in our um, corporate um, 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 uh, premier corporate departments can now go to our partners and say, hey, by the way, uh, not only do we offer um, uh, really a large voice in the industry uh, that sports teams have, and that's why I think this is so interesting, uh, two partners, we can also um, offer and lend a voice in sustainability, and you can partner with us there. In fact, we were one of the first teams to partner with the NFL on their draft when the draft was held in Philadelphia a few years ago. Uh, we were the first team to partner with the NFL on uh, planting um, a butterfly garden for the monarch butterfly. Um, their habitats are being lost up here in the Northeast, and it's actually important to sustaining human life. Go figure. Um, and there's all these things that you learn. Now, folks always come to me and they say, well, how do you educate your fans? Um, that's always such a big question. That's I know what we're talking about today as well. Um, fans come to us and support us because they want us to see win a Lombardi trophy. Um, we're a sports team first. 
However, we understand, just like many other sports teams like the Mets or the Yankees that you just mentioned, understand MLS, NBA, NFL, that um, we have a huge voice, a huge voice. Um, and uh, especially, um, you know, not only, but especially with the upcoming youth um, who statistically seem uh, a lot more interested into sustainability and, you know, as far as some of the research that's been done. But um, we understand that we have that voice. And so the partner with our partners on some of these um, uh, initiatives is, um, is incredibly beneficial to really um, all of us because we can, um, you know, we can help spread the, some of these ideas, some of these news and some of these initiatives to our fans. Uh, next slide. One of them, um, you know, and I always like to share this, is that we have one of the largest solar power plants in the, in the, in the NFL, really, of any stadium in the world. Um, and that would not have been possible without NRG stepping in and saying, look, we want to partner with you. But it goes a little bit beyond this uh, building. And this is where I'll give you a little bit of a snippet where it makes complete sense for a sports team to partner with uh, a, someone like NRG. Um, yes, we, we think it's awesome to have um, a solar power plant that produces 40% of our energy every year. What is really awesome as well is, is that energy helps us uh, we, we actually sell, we don't store that energy on site. We don't have the, that kind of, um, you know, battery on site, even though Amsterdam Arena is trying to do that, but we don't. Um, and it doesn't make sense for us at this point, but we um, sell that uh, energy back to energy. And then energy uh, sells us uh, green energy, whether it's wind, uh, solar rack, um, back to us 100%. So all of our energy that we use to power both of our training facility at Novacare and our stadium, are 100% um, um, uh, green energy. And uh, on top of that, energy also said, look, for 35 years, we're going to give you, and this is, this is some of the nitty gritty here that I, I was talking about earlier. It's really cool. We're going to give you uh, um, a set um, energy cost um, for the next 35 years so that you can budget. This is the amount you're going to spend every year to purchase energy from us. That's really awesome because energy prices fluctuate quite a bit. And for a venue such as ours, you have to budget literally a quarter million dollars every year uh, above because you, you might spend it or you might not, but you can't touch that money in your budget because it might have to be used for energy. Now we can reallocate that $250,000 that was originally budget for energy to other projects. Um, so we've reinvested some of that money into some of the other Go Green uh, projects, uh, such as cleaning the building without chemicals or um, you know, biodigesters or whatever else you can do. Uh, and so I think that's where partners can really help you kind of see the, the, the benefit uh, that comes from um, something, you know, as simple as maybe pressing your own aluminum and realizing that instead of getting $75 a ton, you can get up to $1,200 a ton, uh, depending on where the market fluctuates, right? So it's all those kind of things that we've learned over the years uh, as we've worked with our partners. Uh, and that's just kind of like a snippet and a little bit of a, um, a view into our strategies and what we do. Um, and I'm um, looking forward to the Q&A session. So I'm going to give it back to you. All right. Thank you. Well, thanks for showing how such a successful team can also spend a lot of time and resources and focus on these sustainability efforts. And uh, the communication and the, the fan engagement piece is, is top of mind for a lot of people tuning in today. So I'm going to jump right into some of those questions. Uh, to a reminder to everyone attending, you can feel free to submit your questions into the chat box and we'll try to get to them. And then for all the speakers, just a reminder to throw your video back on and uh, unmute yourself so we can start the conversation for the, the rest of the hour. So first, I'm going to give this one to, to Norman to start, and I'm sure um, Nick and David will both have some comments to add. On the communicating piece, which we always talk about communicating with sustainability, it's very challenging and with sports even more so. So how are sports organizations, I know you touched a little bit on the fan engagement elements at the Eagle specifically, but how are you communicating about these carbon reduction offsetting efforts with fans? And maybe what are some of the most effective channels that are, are working for you? and how you're able to make this a really authentic story, not just a billboard and people walk in and they don't understand the tie to your organization. I, well, in all honesty, I think you, you said it right there. Um, it has to be authentic, it has to be a story. And I think this is where my background of Disney really helps because Disney's all about storytelling and they are master storytellers, right? 
um, you know, when little children, they don't go to Disney World because of, uh, oh, it's a fun ride. You can just do that at your local fair, but it's the story, right? It's the characters that you identify with. And so, you know, we as, at the Eagle said, look, we have a story to tell, but how do we tell it? So with some of our um, maybe um, more mature fan base, uh, we have some fun. We, uh, you know, post uh, over the urinals, for example, recycle your beer here, but your trash responsibly outside. You know, we, uh, we, we play on football. You know, we say kick back your thermostat, it shows a picture of our kicker, kick back your thermostat two degrees and save thousands, you know, on your electric bill. Um, you know, we, uh, we say trash to skins, uh, giants and, uh, and cowboys, especially the cowboys. Uh, sorry to any cowboys fans on the call here, but um, I know you'll appreciate it. Good, good rivalry there. Um, but uh, recycle your, your trash here, you know. And, yeah. and so we have a little bit of fun with them because we know that fans, like I said earlier, are there to um, watch football. Uh, and if they have a few beers in them, you know, if, if it's a little bit more fun and they go relieve themselves, they, they might say like, whoa, look at this, this is funny, you know, recycling. Um, and so it's good to plant some thoughts there. Uh, another way that we do it, we have literally hundreds of thousands of people come through our stadium every year. Right now we don't, but hopefully soon again on tours, uh, especially classes, school classes, colleges, um, you know, private citizens, fans. I mean, anyone comes to our building, literally hundreds of thousands of people um, and on the tour, in our tour script, we've implemented all of our green facts and all of our tour guides are trained on uh, telling folks about these green facts. It's really cool when you go on one of these tours, people are actually like, wow, I had no idea. Um, oh, you thought that parking lot was all just roofs and coverings? And they're like, those are solar panels? That's really cool. And so I think we try to educate our fans that way. Another way that um, NRG, uh, because they understood that, you know, you can't really, when you come in with your car and you park, you really, it looks like it's just a covering uh, from the sun or from uh, the weather. Uh, you don't know that there are solar panels right above, right? So there are some, some uh, billboards out there, as you said, uh, that, that share some of that story, but obviously that's not that's such an effective way. So one way that um, what we used to have is wind turbines uh, on the stadium. I say used to, we, we, we're kind of sad that they're gone now because the company actually went bankrupt. And so we couldn't procure um, any kind of parts to fix them. Also, they didn't really produce much energy at all. Uh, one wind turbine produced as much energy to run a blow dryer. So really, uh, you know, it was zero, zero point whatever energy they produced, but they told the story. So now we're actually not gonna just leave it. We're actually looking into possibly uh, installing rotating solar panels or anything that, in, that tells that story again. Our fans have actually asked about it, interestingly enough. Um, we were wondering if our fans are going to be like, where are those turning things, you know, those wind turbines? They have asked, uh, and that's why we're, we're looking again with NRG into how can we tell that story with, um, you know, on the game day as well. So they can, it's, it's, it's very iconic. It's a, it's a really cool piece on our stadium. Um, you know, it's, it's even featured in, uh, in Madden, and, you know, it's kind of cool. So we, we definitely want to put something back up there. But those are some of the different ways that we share that story. We do understand, however, that our fans come to watch football they don't come to be educated on sustainability. So we try to do it in, in creative and fun and maybe in, uh, in ways that we just infiltrate our sustainability into everything we do, whether it's communicating with our fans. If we send our season ticket member gift to all of our season ticket members every year, let's put a sustainability message in there and let's have the packaging and everything else be sustainable, right? And so that, you know, so that we can share that message that way. And that kind of filters into everything we do. Great. Well, those are a lot of examples that I'm sure people listening could learn from and, and maybe try to include in their own organization. And then Nick, kind of off of, of what Norman's talked about, where tying the messaging of your offsetting and your strategies to the really the, the attitude and the, the personality of the organization, how do you work with some of the, the sports examples that you mentioned to help them design portfolios? Or how do you talk through project options with them so that they can feel like they're choosing projects and choosing a portfolio that fits their, their focus and, and really connects with their fans. Sure. Um, well, uh, again, it, it's about the story and it's about the story that most aligns with uh, what the organization's, um, you know, um, mission may be. Ideally, you find something that's local local makes a huge difference um i wish we had some projects in the philadelphia area but what norman talks about the forest the trees that they planted outside philadelphia is a terrific example that's something that feels close to home it feels like the eagles are making an investment in the local area uh they've made the effort to uh count um count the uh, um 
amount of carbon that, that produces, and that gets communicated and immediately it becomes something that's more than just, hey, we atoned for our, our carbon footprint isn't that great. It's we made an investment in, you know, where you can tangibly go out and take a hike and look at some birds and, and, and so on. Um, so that makes a huge difference. Um, most of our projects are around the globe. Um, they still matter. Um, most organizations will also have a, uh, you know, a strong uh, social mission uh, to their philanthropic side. Um, and we'll try to align a project that, that fits most closely with that. It can be about the education of girls. It can be about economic uh, development, um, something along those lines. And then we will help them help provide those tools to uh, make it easy to help tell that story. Great. And David, anything to add from your side on the, the importance of communicating these efforts and maybe some examples of, of how it's done really well? Um, so uh, I, the only thing I would add is that I think that a lot of fans connect with individual players. So I, I'm not in the space and I don't know very much of how that interaction works. But, you know, if you were to get some of the players involved in some of these activities, whether it's going to plant trees or getting engaged in a particular project or to be a champion for, you know, the solar panels, I think that could be a really powerful way um, to engage with fans. And if there's buying from the team, you know, or the coach, those are obviously, that's the people who you go to see, right? And who you root for, who you want to, you know, throw that touchdown pass or, or do that, that move that you always, the signature move. If, if those folks can also, you know, be advocates for the sustainability, I would imagine that could be tremendously powerful. Yeah, I'll, I'll, echo, Norman, I'll do echo you, that. Yeah, Sorry. go ahead. If, you may, if, if I may, I, I forgot the name of the gentleman. He's a player for the Brewers who's, uh, and I also, someone on the Eagles, Norman, we talked about a while ago, who's, who's, who's a big advocate. And, you know, there are probably more players like that than, than teams think. Uh, and so finding out, you know, if there's a player that has a particularly strong point of view, um, and just give them the tools to help help share the message. It's going to make the whole team look good. Um, this the, the the fellow from the from the Brewers um, has been working with a lot of organizations in Milwaukee, um, making appearances and and uh, you know biking and all kinds of things like that. Um, which is just you know give them the tools to 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 do to do it for you and um, and and share that message and it it makes it twice as easy and ten times more engaging. Yeah, yeah anything would, to add, Norma, on how you've yeah how you've worked with athletes yeah. or yeah, I would say that you don't you don't have to make someone a mad hatter, right? I mean, it's a you know you just give them the the simple tools, especially if they're uh, really uh, already into sustainability. Now, I will say that you know, I, and I think who you're talking about, Nick, is uh, Connor Barwin when he used to be in our team. I mean, the guy was literally biking to uh, to our stadium and uh, he drove a Tesla, and you know, um, it uh, he, he's very very involved, and then of course you know. He went to a different team, but now he's back. He's he's, he's an alumni, uh, retired, and he's actually working with our sustainability, and he's really excited about it. And he's uh, he's he has his own organization too, and uh, he's very involved in Philadelphia. He's built his own playgrounds for kids, green spaces. I mean, pretty cool. Uh, and you're absolutely right. The big voices. Um, one, I've had these discussions a few times. You know, most players, and I think might be from where the background they come from, where they come from, um, social uh, responsibility, social issues. Um, is really on the forefront of a lot of the players. Um, I think in the green sector, we have to do a really good job or a better job at marrying the two because in the example of a playground or a green space, if you go to a um, underprivileged area of a city and you uh, give children a, a safe and a green space to play, uh, you can add sustainability messaging, sustainability elements just by even building it if that's a sustain sustainable uh, a project, right? Um, but you can you can add a monarch butterfly garden to it, or you can you know, and then educate. And I think if you marry the two and say, look, we can make your neighborhood safer, better, cleaner, and then also bring sustainability in, and 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 have these two be married. I think that is that gets some players and some and some guys uh, excited about participating into it, rather than just saying, okay, I'm just doing my social responsibility piece over here, and you guys are sustainability. Um, I think really marrying those two is, is key to getting some of those advocates behind it. Yeah, and we're definitely seeing that even just at the Green Sports Alliance, there's been a lot more interest from athletes and from teams generally wanting to speak more about this. And I think that's 
a trend of a lot of things. Definitely the interest across the board, especially from younger fans, of course, is, is of interest to teams and athletes also just figuring out the, the right way to use their voice. Some of the examples, as you mentioned, it's always easier to follow an athlete who's been successful at it. Um, so let me jump to a couple of questions that we had. Let's see, maybe we'll jump to what are, if we've talked about a lot of, about different strategies that teams can take on in terms of carbon reduction and in terms of sustainability more generally. And maybe I'll ask this to David first. If a team or a venue is listening in, if you would offer maybe for those that haven't looked as much into this or don't really know where to start, some of those first steps recommendations for a team to either learn more about the options out there and or to try to figure out how to create their own sustainability strategy or specifically a, a carbon reduction and offsetting strategy? Um, sure. I think, um, oops, excuse me, the time was ringing. Um, uh, so, uh, sorry about that. Um, the, I think, you know, Nick had a good slide there that talked about what the process is that teams have to go through. And, you know, I think it does need to start with looking at what the objective is, right? Start with the end first. So what is your objective? If you really want to take a leading position in respect of being a climate leader or, you know, just want to be a responsible team or corporate, corporate team or, you know, then what does that look like? And then that will inevitably lead you back to, okay, well, you first have to measure your footprint. And I do think it's important to follow the idea that you want to do what you can internally um, first, because that really gives you the basis for being able to say, well, we've done what we can internally and you know we still have a residual footprint and there's more stuff that we can do and we want to do. And that's really powerful. And once you get there, you know, then there's you know, companies like South Pole who will be able to say, look, here's a whole set of different options. It really is, it can boggle the mind. There's, there's projects all over the world, all sorts of project types, all sorts of benefits, you know, and it, it can be really daunting. So I would certainly not start with that. I'd start with the, the, the more, uh, the stuff that, the stuff that's closer to home, right? The stuff that you deal with on a daily basis, you know, the stuff that Norman was talking about, like your energy bill, you know, um, well, how are people, where, can you provide electric vehicle charging stations to people? The stuff that's really going to impact people directly. And then the other stuff will, will come in due course. And Nick, anything to add on, on that piece? Other recommendations maybe from the South Pole side? I think that was, that, that summed it up terrifically. Um, I mean, the measurement is a key thing. You know, if they say what gets measured gets managed. Um, a lot of times you're going to find cost savings through that process, which is great. Um, and you're always going to find opportunities for improvement um, and then uh, uh, for, for engagement. You know, that's the process is going through that measurement. And Norman, from the team perspective, can you give us a sense of the different individuals, departments that you had to engage and that you continue to engage, not only to set a goal and to make one purchase, either of the trees or you know dealing with the recycling bins but how are you working internally as an organization to get buy-in and to continue on this improvement path as you do one thing and move on to the next yeah that's a that's a good point you have to continually share because um you know especially in sports my goodness we're such a fast moving organization it's unbelievable we everyone moves a mile a minute uh and you have to right you have to be faster than the next guy on the field so um, we've actually formed a committee. We call it the Eco Committee, and um, a good dear friend of mine is actually on this uh, on this webinar, uh, Lindsay Arell. She's our um, consultant when it comes to anything sustainability because she's a total hippie and she gets it. Uh, she'll she'll love me saying that. But so shout out to her from Homicomb Strategies. She really has educated us and helped us to to figure this out. But um, we have um, formed a committee called the Eco Committee. Ah, get it. Um, and it's uh, it's the um, okay. There was no reaction. All right, fine. Um, the um, engagement, so that is um, fan experience, um, the fan experience side, as well as the HR side. So really engaging all of our staff and all of our fans uh, in any creative way. Uh, so two two vice presidents are on that, and they're responsible for that committee. Uh, then we have the communications committee, obviously our annual reporting, anything that we send out to the press, what, what, what I'm speaking about today. Um, we have the community, so anytime we do community engagements, 
uh, or community relations, marketing, really both of our marketing community relations director and vice president are on that. And then we have our operations and that's the force driving our sustainability at the stadium at Novacare. Uh, we have the vice president and uh, a manager and, a, and, a, and another manager on that as well. So we, we meet um, every month and we discuss, well, okay, what's next? Compostable straws, uh, you know, carbon footprint. What you know, biodigesters we're installing. Now we're going to uh, lead certification ISO twenty one to one, which Lindsay helped us with. Um, you know, uh, certification. So really, that that's what is being discussed. But the good thing about that committee is, is that that committee disseminates this entire message throughout the entire organization and beyond. Um, and that's key uh, because if it, it was for years, it was just driven by our operations department, but nobody else in the organization had any clue. They were like, why can't I get this printer to print just one sided? Ah, you know, um, but now there is an education in our cafeteria. There's a big monitor that shows, hey, we've planted this many trees this year. And this is why when you get onboarded, our HR department shows you all the green stuff we do. You know, uh, every year at Earth Day, we invite everyone to come out and do a green project, things like that. When we build our playground every year, there is a big sustainability piece. And, and, and it's always being communicated, talked about in our newsletter every day. There's a green corner. Um, and it has to because you 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 rotate people in and out, but um, like I said, we move so fast that you have to educate internally in order to educate externally as well, or to just share your messaging. Yeah, well, thanks for that. So we just have a couple of minutes left, um, and I'll send this to to each of you if just you can give a potentially quick answer to a very complicated question. Of course, the situation we are in right now with COVID-19, sports shutting down, businesses, including sports, are shifting their priorities. So um, maybe I'll start with David first in terms of what you're seeing as the impact of COVID-19 on the carbon offsetting market. And if you could give us some insight on potential long-term impacts of that, whether teams are going to be focusing more on this given the crisis that is upon us and we know that we're, we really need to be focusing more on these types of crises or if um, you think this may have a potential negative impact in the long term on the on the carbon market so that's a great question that is a an impossible one to answer i think i yeah i'm not gonna <laughs> speculate what, I, what i'm gonna do is just say that i think climate change is not going away um, I think the pandemic has only made us realize that with emerging crises that we know are going to happen or are already on our doorstep, we need to do something about that. So what we have seen is that corporates who have made commitments to you know, taking climate action, we don't see those falling away. Um, I think, you know, by way of example, if you look at the tech sector, they're not being affected in a great way by this. So they will continue to make investments in this. Um, you know, other sectors may be more impacted from a financial perspective, and that will depend on what sector folks are in. But I think overall, you know, climate change is a real issue. We know it's a problem. We know we've not done enough to do it. And I think there's a really important role that corporates, teams, and leagues can play to help drive this forward. So you know, I think there's there's a great opportunity, of course, you know, you know, find a cash and, you know, being able to finance these activities uh, needs to be kind of walked through all the way up through up through the, the top levels of each organization. But I do think that it is an investment in the future and something that's really important that we all do. I think in the end can be a very powerful motivator uh, and a great way to engage, you know, a team's fans. And Nick, anything to add from from what you're seeing or, or what you yeah, you may I mean, see from some of your customers. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, D David summed it up pretty well. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, an investment in climate action is really about <clears throat> building resilience and you know um, the sort of overall health of this planet is deeply, deeply interconnected. It's very likely that some of these um, health issues are, are are ultimately related to how we've been taking care of the planet at large. Climate change happens to be one of the, the, the big issues as well, a sort of long, slow cooker, if you will, um, uh, which sometimes makes it a little bit harder for people to get their head around it. Um, but at the end of the day, it's about building resilience, and it's all an investment. Um, and uh, I think people are starting to realize that. It's very interesting. You know, I, I, I think, yes, in the short term, there may be uh, you know, priorities are going to be on on health and 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 you know saving people's jobs, 
Um, but fundamentally, as a long-term investment uh, action on climate and and what we're calling sustainability in general, um, is is a, is an investment in in human health, and uh, that that connection is becoming more clear. Norman, anything else to add at the final few seconds we have? Yeah, I, I think now more than ever, it's really important to be a, a strong voice in the room. Um, you know, when uh, when there's a crisis, everyone is like, uh, grab the dog, the kids, let's go run, right? And so I talked to a friend of mine yesterday at the uh, Seattle Seahawks, and we were talking about everyone right now is like, buy masks, no more water fountains, buy plastic bottles for everyone, you know? So um, that's where I think uh, she and, and myself have to be loud voices in the room and say, whoa, 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 we still have a sustainability program. Can we think about this for a second, right? If we get masks, are they going to be recyclable? Are they, you know, and uh, it, it's, you know, I think it's very, very important to, uh, to be a, a strong voice in the room and say, hey, let's not forget sustainability, though, as we manage this crisis. Thank you for those final words and thank you to everyone for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. We know we didn't get to all the questions, but we will do our best to follow up. Just one plug for our next webinar, which will be two weeks from today. We'll be talking about food waste and also its relation to the COVID-19 shutdown with the World Wildlife Fund. So thank you again. We really appreciate it and we hope you can join us for our next session. Have a great rest of your day.